Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I can't believe it's our last week. This went really fast. Okay, so we're going to get started here. Um, this is our last week. This week's session is entitled Improving Human Capacities. And once again, we have four wonderful faculty presenters today to talk to you about themes related to AI and you know changing identities. So once again, I want you all to think about sort of cross connections between all of the talks, but also think about previous talks and you know themes or ideas or connections that might come up for you. So we're going to get started for the sake of time here. Our first presenter is Dr. Olson. Okay, so I think everyone can see my screen. Thank you so much. Um, so today, what I want to talk to you about is hopefully something that is close to all of you, which is thinking about AI and how we can use it to build educational technology that we use in the classroom. Today, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you an outline a little bit about who I am, what is AI, and how we can build it, and how we can, uh, how AI can really help us in the classroom. So let's start a little bit with who am I? So for this, I am a faculty member in our computer science department, so very close to thinking about how we use AI. And with computer science, what I want us to think about is that we really, computer science is using technology to solve problems. So it's kind of on the software side, but that doesn't mean it's just kind of building software, right? We interface with hardware, we interface with humans, we analyze data, we build the software, we write algorithms, kind of all of these things. In the last four weeks, you've been learning about a lot of this, right? The whole topic of this is AI. You've been seeing how these, how AI has helped you in these other areas. And what I want you to think about is how these skills, especially in computer science, how it can be useful to have them because then it helps you guide how AI is used in your field and kind of what the next steps are. Because you've been hearing a lot about this and like where the issues are and everything. And so if you're like, well, I'm I love biology, I'm interested in any, any of these other things, you can say, well, how do, how do I want to have these skills to guide how we use AI in those fields going forward? And that's really what computer science is about. How can we solve these problems using technology? So for me, my corner of computer science is kind of in between human-computer interaction, education, and cognition. And when we think about these, so, uh, Cognition is kind of the psychology side. So think about how do humans actually think about. I know you all talked and heard from Dr. Getz last week. Um, so I am part of that cognitive science minor that she had talked a little bit about. We bring in the human computer and interaction. So how do we build this technology to really support humans? How do we use it to make our lives better and to better understand humans? And then with the domain I apply this in is education. And so think about how can we better the way that we learn? How can we study the way that we learn? How can we build technology to help us in the way that we learn? And so that's a little bit about me and the perspective I'm going to be taking on AI today. So I know you've heard a lot about this a little bit, what is AI? And I want to talk about this from a computer science perspective and how we can really build it out. So for this, the first thing I want to have you think about are are these artificial intelligence? So I'm going to go ahead and have you all say in the chat, just put a number next to it and say yes or no. So I want you to think about is chat GPT artificial intelligence? So you can just put a one and you could say yes if you think it is, no if you think it's not. And just go ahead and kind of say this in the chat, which of these you think are artificial intelligence, which you think are not. So we're seeing kind of for one, there's lots of yeses. Some said all but six with the calculator. Some say yes to all. Some say yes but six. Some say one and five. And so we're kind of looking at these all and we're saying, well, what are these? Kind of do we have these? And so we have these different examples, right? Chat GPT, which is using our large language models, our uh, kind of in-house services like Alexa and Siri, our Netflix recommendations, which is giving us uh, information about what we should watch next, our calculator, which helps us do kind of these calculations. And so based off this, let's look at what the definition of artificial intelligence is. So just from the dictionary, it's really the theory and development of computer systems that are able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. For this, what I want us to focus on 
is the part that says normally require human intelligence. So a lot of times when we say, you know, everything except for the calculator, at one point, a calculator would have been AI. Everyone would have said that. We couldn't calculate things without human intelligence. And so something that we need to think about with AI is it's often a moving target. As we build more technology, then some things that we had before, we no longer consider artificial intelligence because they're just kind of built into our everyday lives. And so then we start to say, well, that's not artificial intelligence because obviously computers to, can do it. It doesn't normally require human intelligence. We've been able to do these things forever. A calculator is just a simple computing device. But at one point, right, when it was new and it was on the forefront, then we considered it artificial intelligence. So these large language models that were like, they're changing the world, right? They're changing how we see these things. You could consider that in the near future, as we make progress, maybe we'll look back and we'll no longer say, that those are artificial intelligence because those are just kind of regular things. We haven't had to use human intelligence to do those things in a long time. And so when we think about artificial intelligence, it's hard to kind of pinpoint because a lot of times it feels like a moving target, right? As we make progress, then things that used to feel astounding no longer do. And so that's something I want us to keep in mind when we're th saying, well, how do we build artificial intelligence? What is it? Because some things that seem very simple. And when you think about them, you might not consider it. You have to think about when they were developed as well. So with this definition, I want us to look at a little bit how we actually built out artificial intelligence so we can have the appreciation of how we use it in education. So first, one way that we have artificial intelligence is by having expert rule-based systems. And so this is the idea that we as humans are experts in a task and we're able to define and take our intelligence and we're able to translate it into a computer, into a machine. We can build out this knowledge base and so we can really uh, have the computer, have a set of rules that are able to kind of mimic our knowledge. And then this computer with these set of rules is able to interface with the user who isn't an expert and be able to help them with something. Now with this, it's hard to say, we might look at, we might say, well, how is this AI? How is this artificial intelligence, right? It didn't do anything. The computer kind of is just copying our knowledge, but that still is artificial intelligence in the sense that we have taken our knowledge and we constructed it into this machine, which can then mimic it and go through and kind of copy this and do um, and successfully help someone who isn't an expert. That isn't what we normally think of though, but it is kind of one of the, one of the ways that we can make our computers intelligent is by building these expert systems. Next, and this is what you're probably more used to thinking about, is the idea of having machine learning within uh, to build out our artificial intelligence. We don't have time today to be able to go into all of the different algorithms and models that we're able to build with machine learning. But this is a lot of times when we think about it, when we have these systems um, with machine learning, what it's able to do is sometimes it can improve itself as it goes along. With our expert models, whatever we build out is what the computer can do. Our goal with machine learning often is to be able to build something and as it gets more knowledge and as it gets feedback based off of that, it's able to improve and it's able to do better. And it's able to kind of take in that data and change. And so that's what we see with in our AI, we kind of have this machine learning and we have different types of algorithms in that. And then within that, we kind of have this deep learning. And that's where we have some of these neural networks and everything. And that's where our large language models come from. And that's where we start to build out these more complicated models that are able to um, take in lots of data and be able to do this learning as it goes along. Now, both our expert models and our machine learning are ways of us processing data. We're able to kind of take in uh, we're able to have this data and we're able to make sense of it and have kind of some output. But with this, that's kind of just one part of doing, of doing the processing. And when we want to think about a whole system, that's where we want to start to think about with our artificial intelligence, how we can build these out into cognitive architectures. And so cognitive architectures is a way of thinking about how we structure a lot of this artificial intelligence. And so the idea behind a cognitive architecture is you, is you have this whole system. There's some way of getting input in. And so you could think about that might be text. All of you typing in the chat 
That might be speech, us being able to listen and doing our natural language processing. Um, that could be our pictures. That could be kind of anything that's coming in. So we have this input. We have the processing. That's where we're using kind of our expert models. That's where we're using our machine learning to kind of make sense of it and process the data. And then we have our output. We need to have some way to communicate back to our user. So again, this could be through text. It could be through speech. Um, it could be through visualizations, but we need some way to have output to get it back out. In our cognitive architectures, anytime you talk to someone in psychology, right, a lot of times we're building these out in different ways. You can build them out to say we just want something efficient, but often we want to build them out too to mimic the way that we have, the way we think about humans um, computing things and the way that we have cognition. So sometimes we'll have memory in them to be able to say, well, how do we Visual, how do we store our visual memory? How do we store our auditory memory? Can we make sense of the way that humans think by building out these cognitive architectures as well and having these processors? Any of these cognitive architectures can really focus on different aspects, right? So if you're trying to do um, image processing, you might have a different cognitive architecture than if you're trying to do um, things like thinking about just uh, how people learn and trying to think about, well, what rules do we have behind that? And so it's really a way of structuring the, our systems to be able to have this input, the processing, and the output. So with this, then we have an idea of kind of how we're building out these systems. Right? We have the way that we're doing this processing. We have the way that we can sometimes structure our systems. But how can this help us in the classroom? And so I want to go into very specific examples of things that you've probably used and worked with to think about, well, how is artificial intelligence there, even if you haven't thought about it being artificial intelligence? So the first thing we can think about is it can provide help and feedback. So I'm sure almost all of you in like elementary school, high school, middle school have used, have like either played an educational game, have used some sort of software that has helped you learn. Often they're able to provide hints to you, they're able to provide feedback to you as you go along. And these can often be built on expert systems or, on, or by using some of these machine learning processing. So for example here, this is a chem tutor. So for college chemistry to help people learn. And as they go through, it's able to give feedback and it's able to um, kind of give hints as people go through. You've seen that similar things with Khan Academy. So if you've ever used that to help you with your mathematics, it gives hints, it helps you structure what the next step might be. And often those are built on these expert systems, right? We've looked at how experts solve problems. We've been able to say, here are the next steps, here are common errors that people make. And how can we say, well, if you're in this state, here would be the good next step to be able to go forward. And so we've had these, right? It's built into our educational technology that we've all used to be able to get help. The next thing you might think about is learning through teaching. And so for this, in our educational technology, right, sometimes we build out these avatars that we're working with. And so you can think about it that as you're working, maybe your job is to be able to teach this avatar. For this avatar to be able to learn, often we're using these cognitive architectures, right? We have to think, well, how does someone really learn? Because we need to be able to mimic that to have you be able to teach them. And so this means that you might do things, you might talk to them in a chat, you might build out a knowledge graph or a concept map, and they take those as inputs. They do processing on it to say, well, based on this input, how would someone actually take this information in and how would they change their knowledge base to learn from it? And then based off of that, they need to give you output so that you can judge if you think that this avatar has learned or not. If they've done some, if they haven't learned, then you change your approach for how you're teaching them. And through that, you're actually learning yourself because we know how, uh, how strong it is, how important it is that how much we can actually learn by teaching others. Because we have to think about, well, how do we change the way that we describe things? And we need to have an understanding of it to be able to describe it to someone else. And so instead of having to always have another student available or something, we can build these out into avatars to have them actually mimic this learning to help you do the teaching. We can also look at how can we provide awareness in the classroom. And so this is stepping a little bit away from students, sometimes with students, but also with all of your instructors and thinking about, well, when you're in the classroom, when you're 
working on things, sometimes it's hard to know when the instructor has to come over to help, right? If you're working on a worksheet and you've been trying a problem for a while and you keep trying something new, but you can't get the answer and you've been struggling a lot, that's something that's known as like wheel spinning, right? You're stuck in that one place, but your wheels are still going around. Anyone who lives in a cold climate knows this if you've ever gotten stuck in the snow, right? You're stuck there and you just need someone to come over and help push you out. And that's the same idea, right? But when you're in a classroom, even with 20 people, it's hard for your teacher to know that you're in that state. And that's something where artificial intelligence can help, right? They can look at the pattern of things that you've been trying and they can say, well, maybe you're wheel spinning. Maybe you're just guessing checking, right? Sometimes you're just sitting there clicking on as many things as possible so you can get to the next step. And if they can recognize those actions, then your instructor can come over and can help you to be able to kind of get on the next step to help you learn and to help you kind of make uh, the choice to, to be able to uh, get you to think about, well, what would I actually do? How, what, where am I struggling on this? And so we can think about this awareness. It can go to your instructor, it could go to you, but we have this way of saying, well, how can we take this data and information and make it more visible so that we can have a more productive classroom. We can also think about our teamwork. So I'm sure everyone has worked with a team before and you've just struggled communicating with one another, right? It's a skill we have to learn. We don't all just wake up able to kind of work collaboratively and work on a team. But sometimes it's really hard, right? When we're working on a team, something that we know is very useful is to be able to listen to someone's idea and then make sure you're on the same page by being able to revoice what they're saying. And so the idea of revoicing is you take the information and you say it in a different way. And then that way you can say, yes, I have an understanding, you have an understanding, we've grounded this in the same kind of concepts. But we don't always know to do that, right? Sometimes we're talking past each other and we don't realize it. And so that's something, especially if you're like doing it in a chat, where a chatbot could recognize that these actions aren't being taken and could prompt you for that, right? They could have you be like, oh, do you think you could rephrase what Susie has said? And they can start to have you do those actions. The more you kind of get those prompts, the more you start working it into what you regularly do with your teamwork, which means it can stop prompting, right? It can kind of reduce that scaffolding that you have. So we all know how annoying it is when someone reminds you to do something when you are already going to do it, which means we need the artificial intelligence to not over script us and to kind of help us out as we go along. And so it can learn from what you're doing to be able to script when it needs, kind of give those hints when it needs to, but not do it when it doesn't need to. Another thing we're going, you, it can help with is recommendation systems. So this isn't the most interesting kind of picture here, but you can think about when you're at a university, all of you are taking a class on AI right now. You might be like, I love this. What other classes can I take about AI? What have common themes, shared concepts? And sometimes that's really hard. Right now you're going to go to your advisor and you're going to say, what other classes can I take? And they're going to have to help you with that. But again, that's something that AI can look at, right? When we have these words kind of, when we have these classes tagged with things like keywords and concepts and things that they learned, suddenly we can build out these social networks, right? We can build out these graphs and we can say, all these classes are different nodes. How strong are the connections between different classes? Are they, do they have very strong connections? Are there a lot of concepts that are overlapping? Would someone, if they like this class, then really like this other class? Or are there kind of weaker connections? And you might see that like things inside of departments might be stronger, but sometimes there's really strong connections between departments too. As you've kind of seen the last four weeks with AI, everyone has some concept in it in their department. And how can you make those connections yourself by being able to see them? And it's really hard for us as humans to always do that. But it's something where artificial intelligence can very well look at all of that data and help us to see what courses have shared concepts to help you kind of plan out what you would want to take and what's of interest to you. Finally, last thing I wanted to talk about as an example are things like early detection systems. Because this is the idea sometimes, especially when we're starting college, we all struggle. I think everyone has kind of that story of their first semester, something that kind of went wrong. How do we get past it? Or even further along, you just never kind of know when a life event is going to hit. And sometimes it's useful to say, well, how can we recognize that early to be able to help students? And it's hard to, because 
Every one of your instructors has a tiny glimpse of what's going on in your life, but no one always gets the overall picture. So that's something if we can bring that data together, then a system can kind of highlight uh, when interventions might need to be put in place, what students kind of need that help. Um, and if you're able to catch that earlier before kind of people end up not feeling supported, then you're going to be able to put that support in early. And that again, is something that it's hard for us as humans to be able to do. So for all of this, kind of the links I want you to see is in education, we're never trying to replace the humans. No one's sitting there being like, go to the classroom, you're going to be taught by a robot, it's going to be great. But really it's how do we augment what we can do as humans? There are things that are difficult for us to do, and there are things that humans do incredibly well. And what we want to be able to do is augment it so that we can still have those human connections, right? For the early detection systems, we want the humans to be able to have, be able to come in and help, not necessarily the system coming in, you know, for the help and feedback and awareness and everything. How can we make it so that your instructor has more time with you to be able to do that by recognizing when things are kind of going wrong? So with all of these, what I want you to kind of think about for the Q&A and discussion sessions is kind of what are the risks to these as well? And so we can think about how are these systems being used? Right, so we talked about a lot of these pros, but you could imagine that with all of this, you know, for example, an early detection system, we're like, it's great. You can recognize when students need help. You can put interventions in place. But what if an administrator came in and their policy was, Anyone that's struggling, we're just going to kick them out right away, right? You could imagine that in the wrong hands, these systems could not be useful. That can kind of tie to the third point as well of can it create confirmation bias, right? If you, you see someone struggling at the beginning, are you going to suddenly treat them differently and say, of course they failed because I had kind of given up on them because I saw that maybe they were struggling. And so you have to be careful with those as well about what you're actually doing and how you're treating it when you get this data, because you don't want people to see this data and start to treat students differently than they would have if it's in kind of a negative way. The other thing is, did we agree for our data to be used for these purposes? A lot of this data is coming from you as students. And when you're making this data, you expect it to be used in certain ways. And so suddenly if your data is being used in a way that you didn't agree to, is that okay? And do we need to make sure that everyone knows what your data is being used for in advance? And then finally, who's kind of responsible for these decisions that are being made? So all of you are going through, um, and if these kind of systems make a decision, then, and it goes poorly, who's responsible for that? Was it the computer that's responsible? Was it for the university that implemented it? Was it for the instructor who implemented it? And that's why we need to say too, I think it's much better for AI to go hand in hand with humans and how they kind of work together, rather than saying, well, we're going to offload all decisions to the computer. Even though it might be able to recognize things, we still need to have this collaboration between them. With that, if you are interested in this, definitely these were some of the students I worked with this summer um, in computer science but also a handbook just came out this year of artificial intelligence and education. And so you could read more a little bit on the topic there. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Olson, that was wonderful. And such good food for thought for students to kind of, you know, work those critical thinking skills to think about, you know, some of the risks and, you know, negative sides of these AI tools that help support students and instructors, enhance the educational experience. So. That will make for a really great uh, discussion talk. We're gonna move right along and our next presenter is Dr. Appleton Knapp. All right, so um, first of all, I just wanna introduce myself. Um, I'm Sarah Appleton Knapp and I am a cognitive psychologist. So again, um, like Dr. Getz and Dr. Olson, I'm part of the cognitive sciences minor um, in addition to the psychology major. Um, and I am, really interested in the brain processes that allow us to learn. So I'm, I'm really interested in human learning and memory. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a lot today um, specifically about the large language models and how you can use them to help you in your study, right? Um, so basically um, AI is a tool. It's like a calculator. Um, I know we, we talked about calculators in the last session. And so 
um, using these, you know, th there's a lot of when when the gen the large language models came out last um, like November, I guess. Um, there was a lot of talk in academia of, oh no, you know, our students going to use these to write their papers and you know plagiarism and all this kind of stuff. And it's similar to the kind of discussions that that were, um, you know, that were surrounding when calculators first came out. It's like, oh, are people no longer going to be able to do math? The calculator is just going to do it for them, right? And so every time you have one of these new technologies come out, you have that sort of situation of how should this be used appropriately, right? Um, and so, you know, when you think about how you use a calculator, right? You have to understand math. You have to understand what problem you're trying to solve. And then you can use the calculator to help you, um, you know, not make mistakes in adding or subtracting or, or things like that, right? Um, and, and so it doesn't actually do the math for you, but it, it helps you make you more efficient, right? So as Dr. Olson said, it helps augment you, right? Um, and so, you know, you may have a math class where calculators are allowed during exams. You may have math class where calculators aren't allowed, right? And so we've we figured out sort of how to navigate using calculators, right? Um, and so I'm going to talk about the ways that um, for chat GPT, for example, um, that you can use that to, um, to navigate um, or, or how, to, how to navigate using that to augment your studying, right? So these, these generative language models can help you study, they can make you more efficient. Um, and there are lots of ways that you can use them to improve your own learning without having them sort of write your paper for you, right? So that's sort of what I'm gonna be focusing on today. Um, so to back up though, before we talk about how to, to or examples of how you can use these, um, I just wanna go over some principles of um, effective study practices. So um, first of all, when we think of, of learning something, right? There's a, there's a big difference between learning and performance. So I want you to imagine if you are learning golf. Some of you may know golf. Some of you may have never golfed before, right? I've never golfed, but um, when I've, I've watched, when my son was taking golfing lessons, I watched the instructor, right? And, and so the instructor would position his hands on the club, right? And the instructor would, would help him position his feet. And, and so when you're perfectly positioned and then you take a swing, right? Your performance is really good because you're set up to succeed, right? You're, you're doing a really good job because you have everything in place to make it so that you can perform really well. But the difference between performance and learning then is so the next day, if you go to the golf course and you try and take that swing, are you able to remember where to put your hands? Are you able to remember where to put your feet, right? And so if you are, then your performance is going to be good, right? But if, you, if you're unable to remember how to do that, then, then your performance is going to suffer, right? And so the idea of learning is that you have to be able to repeat this performance, right? Um, and so performance during study often can be not a very good indicator of whether or not you've learned, right? Because of course you're going to perform well if you've done 10 of the same math problems in a row, because you've just done nine more. Okay, great. I'll do another one. But that doesn't show that you've learned then so that if you were presented with a problem like that in the future, if you'd be able to reproduce that, right? Um, and so there, there are two psychology terms that I just want to briefly talk about when we're talking about learning. There's this idea of encoding and the idea of retrieval, right? So the idea of encoding, and these are based on... Uh um so the the idea of encoding is um if you are taking in information and you're you're able to um have it in long-term memory right then you've encoded it right so anything that you have in long-term memory you've encoded so um you know you've you can tell someone your phone number, you have that encoded in long-term memory, for example, right? Um, and so retrieval is pulling that information out or accessing that information, right? So when someone asks you for your phone number, it's in your long-term memory and you tell them your phone number, you're retrieving it from your long-term memory, right? Um, and so what we want to do when Excuse we- me? Is we want to make it so that um, you're- you're able to retrieve this information so that you're encoding it effectively and you're able to retrieve it, right? And so sometimes the conditions during study, and so this is the reading that I gave you talking about these different conditions, that they're difficult study conditions that lead to better learning, right? And so when I, an example of a difficult study condition would be, um, again, in a math class, right? So if you're doing a math, or if you're studying math problems and you do all the same problems in a row, say you have, you're figuring out the circumference of a circle, right? And you have eight different problems. And by problem number eight, you don't even have to worry about what the formula is because you've just done it, right? 
Um, whereas if you have that mixed up with, then there's asking for area of a circle or asking for the area of a triangle or asking for the perimeter of a rectangle, right? And, and they're all mixed up, right? That's more difficult to study because each problem you have to think, you have to use this retrieval, right? Oh, what's the formula for that? It's a different formula, right? And so studying like that is harder, right? But it actually leads to better long-term learning, right? And so in, in the learning literature, we call these desirable difficulties, right? They're desirable because they help you learn, right? Um, and often people don't enjoy them because they're not fun, right? So I'm um, having quizzes all the time is an example of a desirable difficulty. Students don't like having a quiz every week, right? But they're really great for long-term learning, right? Um, so the three that I'm gonna, the three desirable difficulties that I'm gonna talk about today um, that can be, um, that can, that you can use ChatGPT, for example, to help you use these in your study. Um, the three that I'm gonna talk about today are spacing study, um, interleaving versus blocking study, and then using tests as learning events. So spacing is simply the idea that when you study information and you space it out, you learn it better. So for example, all of you, I'm sure, have been somewhere at a party or something, and someone introduces themselves to you, right? So, you know, hi, my name's Tanya, whatever and you think. Oh, okay, nice to meet you, Tanya, right? And then a half hour later, maybe an hour later, someone might ask you, oh, who that, who's that person? You know, I saw you, I saw her introduce you to her. What's her name? You know, and, and you think, oh, no, I don't remember her name. Right. And so that's an example of that. If you have space in between the introduction and when you're having to retrieve the name. Right. It's difficult. Right. And so when we think about spacing and study, what we want to do is we want to space study so that you're just about so that you you retrieve the information right before you'd be about to forget it, right? So in this example of meeting this woman named Tanya, right? Um, you meet her and you might think, you know, a couple of minutes later, oh, right, remind yourself, her name's Tanya, right? So you're doing that retrieval before you forget. And then maybe five minutes after that, oh, okay, yeah, right, her name's Tanya. And so again, you're reminding yourself, you're doing this retrieval. So now you have a couple of practices retrieving, right? And then when someone asks you the person's name, you've sort of spaced the study out and you're able to say their name. And that's much better than just repeating the name over and over again. So you could say, oh yeah, her name's Tanya, 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 Tanya. And that's not gonna do anything for you, right? Because that's not a difficult retrieval, right? So, um, so spacing study then allows this sort of increased difficulty, which improves learning. Um, interleaving versus blocking study is the example that I gave you with the math problems, right? That if you are studying, you know, all the circumference of a circle in a row, it's much easier by the time you get to problem A, right? But it doesn't enhance learning. It doesn't force you to look at each new problem fresh and have to retrieve whatever formula you need, right? For example. So that's something that we're gonna talk about how you can do that with AI. Um, and then finally, this idea of using tests as learning events. So that's the idea of quizzing yourself. So a quiz in class is useful because you actually will take the quiz, right? But if you quiz yourself, that's also a really useful learning event because you're practicing this retrieval, right? Okay. So. Uh, let's see. There we go. Um, so, so one way that students can do these without AI, right, is to create study guides. You know, you that way you can test yourself. You can um, you can create a sample test from a study guide, right? Um, you can make flashcards. But all of these things are really, really time consuming, right? And so students often don't do them as much, or or maybe they'll start to do flashcards, but then they'll they, they just run out of time, right? And so um, this is something where um, I'm going to actually walk you through how you would create a study guide using ChatGPT. So um, I'm going to do a lot of stopping, sharing, and sharing again, because I'm going to actually walk you through it. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and I'm going to take you over to, um, I have this um, list here of words. So say, for example, your, your professor says, okay, so for chapter five, these are the terms I want you to learn, right? So if you were to create your own study guide, um, you know, you maybe start typing in the definitions of these terms, you'd have to look them all up. That would be really time consuming, right? So this is something where um, you can actually copy these um, and then you can go over and, uh, and this is the free version of ChatGPT. Um, let's see, there we go. Uh, Okay, so here um, I'm going to just tell ChatGPT, Chat GPT, sorry, to define the following terms. 
And so you're going to get this list of terms, right? And so you see this is much, much faster than if you're to do these terms yourself. So now here is where the big warning comes, and that is that you really have to make sure that chat GPT is correct, right? So sometimes they won't be exactly the way that the term is maybe used in your class or something like that. And so this can be part of your study process. If, if so now you have these terms and you can look up and you can say, okay, so selective attention. Let's see, let me look at the textbook. Let me recall what my professor said in class. Is this right? And so then you can modify it and make sure it's right because that's one of the things when you're using these as tools, it's your responsibility to check, right? Because chat GPT will make things up, right? Um, and so you go through this list and you, you try and figure out, is this, is this exactly what, what, what I'm looking for? Um, okay, so there we go, let's see. All right, so now that you have it, you check the output for errors. Um, and, and so you have the study guide. And one of the really key things when you're thinking of learning is you don't wanna just memorize material. You really need to understand it, right? You need to understand you know, how these concepts work, right? So for example, um, for our cognitive psychology terms, it's really useful to, to think of applied examples. So we'll think of the first term on that list of selective attention. It's like, okay, so selective attention is essentially the idea that if, um, that I can choose where to focus my attention, right? So the applied example would be the gardener was just outside and you know using the blower and I was focusing on what I'm talking to you about as opposed to what, what was happening outside my window, right? And so that's the idea of selective attention. And so, so that's a really good way in psychology to be able to know that you really understand is to be able to think of an application or you know, be able to use the term in a situation. And that's something you can add to that study guide, right? And so that's that's where you're really doing the comprehension piece. Well, once you comprehend it, then you need to make sure that you memorize it. And that's another place where we can um, use AI to help us out. Um, so something that ChatGPT can do is create a table. So again, I'm going to... Um... Okay, so now we say, we tell ChatGPT, we say, um, create a two-column... Whoops, spelling would be good too. Um, table of these terms. Okay. And so it creates this table for us. And the reason that the table is useful is because then we can just copy these terms from the table. And again, I'm doing this real time. It was important for me to do this real time because I want to show you how easy it is, right? So this is one where if you're if you're doing that processing and making examples, I would put this into a table and then add your your examples so that when you're studying, you'd have your examples at hand. Um, so then when we do this, okay. So then I'm going to use Excel, but you can use um, you know you could use Google Sheets, something like that. Um, but we have this, and we're just going to go ahead and paste our terms in. And we have this nice table, okay? So once we have that, this is another free tool um, that is um, by Dr. Olson's definition, also AI in the sense that it's a learning tool. It's something that is, you know, it has sort of logic behind it. And I'm gonna show you, this is called Anki. You may have heard of it, you may have not. Um, if you are going into medicine, I can guarantee you, you'll use it to study for the MCAT. Um, but so once we save this as a text, we can actually put it into this program, which, which does, another what we were talking about as far as one of these desirable difficulties. So let's see, we'll call this chapter five. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Okay. So here we go. Um, I'm going to go ahead and we have Anki over here. Okay. okay, so once we have Anki, we can go ahead and we can create our flashcards. We're going to call this chapter five. You can tell I've been playing with it. I've been making other decks. Um, so once we have our chapter five, um, whoops, oops, sorry. Oh, shoot. Didn't mean to do that. Okay. One second. Uh, okay. 
There we go. Okay, so we have this. <clears throat> we can create our deck here, import file. We have chapter five, open, import. Okay, so now we have our flashcards for chapter five. Um, and what's great is then we can study these. Um, and this is the great power of Anki study now. So when you are doing the flashcards, so I've put these in forwards and backwards. So for example, you can see that this one is giving you the definition, right? And so you get the definition and then you have to stay the word. So this is another thing of of when we're when we're trying to study, we want to study things in different directions, right? So if you see the definition, you should be able to retrieve the word. If you see the word, you should be able to retrieve the definition, right? And so this again makes learning more powerful by by studying both ways. And so when you see this and you say, okay, so um, let's see. Oh, so this, oh, it gave us the definition, then it went on. Okay, so, but you, it, it is in here in both ways. So say this was really hard. You say, okay, I want to see it again in one minute, right? And so then you see the next term and you, you show the answer, you test yourself. You're like, oh, I'm really good at this one, right? And so this, this software then, what's really powerful about this is that this is actually helping you do the spacing. It's doing exactly what with your terms for your psychology class, it's doing exactly what we're talking about at the party when you're trying to remind yourself is that, you can you have this sense of oh was this really hard for me to figure out if it was then I need to see it sooner right or oh this was really easy I can see it later right um, and so again this is another way that we can use this technology um, in order to study um, to make our study more efficient um, in a way that um, would take a lot more time if we weren't using the technology okay. All right, so that is another option. Um, and then another thing you can do in ChatGPT, which I'm not going to do because it's really easy, um, is you can actually have ChatGPT make sa sample tests for you, right? And so for something like that, you would you would say, you know, based on the on the definitions that that we have here, um, you can put them back in after you've put your examples in. For example, you could say, you know, based on these definitions, create you know ten multiple choice questions, right? And it'll create those questions. And it will give you the answers. And then so obviously don't look at the answers and test yourself and see, you know, how well am I doing? Um, and so, again, these are things where if you're trying to create that yourself and make up a test that you are then going to take, it would take a lot of time. Right. Um, but by using these technologies, you can save a lot of time and you get the same output. Right. So so these are just a lot of examples of where based on these desirable difficulties, right, based on these kinds of um strategies that cause the best learning, but that are really time consuming without some of these tools, these tools can make them a lot less time consuming and can actually optimize and make your learning better, right? So with the same amount of time, you can get a lot more learning. in. Um, all right. So just to conclude, um, ChatGPT can save a lot of time in making study materials, but you still have to study, right? So if you start doing this the night before the exam, it's not going to be useful. <laughs> it's not going to be helpful. You're, you're still not going to have enough time, right? Um, so obviously managing your time is important. Um, and, and so, yeah, spacing is powerful. So not only do you not want to wait until the last minute because you will end up not having time to cover everything, but you don't want to wait until the last minute because your time spent studying will be much less if you space it out, right? So um, uh, what I tell students in my cognitive psychology class, I, I say, look, you know, do the terms at the end of the chapter that the exam isn't until the end of the first module, right? Which is five chapters. So make sure that you study chapter one right after we've talked about chapter one and then chapter two right after we've talked about chapter two and then, you know, maybe chapter three and then review the other two. You know, that, that kind of space in your study is gonna be really, really good. Um, and also, this is something that, you know, in the in the idea of desirable difficulties, um, and this is both with the flashcards that I showed you and with the making up tests, is that testing yourself is a lot more effective than just rereading notes, right? So um, the one reason why I think students often do reread notes, one, it's easier than testing yourself, right? In the sense of cognitively, it's easier, right? But but as, as I mentioned, that that difficulty is actually doing something for your learning, right? So um, you want to pursue that, even though it sort of hurts more. Um, but I think another reason that people don't test themselves and that they just reread the materials because just frankly, a lack of time, right? And so I'm hoping that the, the tools that I've talked about today will help you in that, that you can do some of these really much more effective um, study strategies, right? Because the um, technology 
compresses the amount of time that it takes to create these materials. Okay. All right. And I'd be happy to talk more about them in, in Q and A at the end and also in the, um, in the discussion section after. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, what a great, you know, um, presentation on all of these free tools, you know, the students can uh, use to strategize and studying is such an integral part of doing well. Yeah, so, you know, adopting these tools and using them to strategize and study and, uh, you know, learning yourself how you study best and trying out different methods and taking the time to, um, you know, uh, play around with different, different uh, options. You, you all have a lot more options than we all had growing up, so it's kind of exciting seeing all these tools. And I'm going to look into Anki because I've never seen that before to use in my French classes. So we have one faculty presenter who uh, is not in attendance. So we're going to skip to our last uh, faculty member, Dr. Kim, who will close out the lectures. So my name is Jay Kim. I am in the Industrial Systems Engineering Department here at USC. Uh, let me, I'm going to give you some uh, personal and also perspective on AI from our major. The first thing I got to do when we talk about anything within our major or from my major's perspective is people have no idea what industrial systems engineering actually does. Uh, it's one of the biggest challenges from our major. Uh, I personally didn't know what it was when I was an undergrad. Um, I got into it uh, as a grad student. Uh, a lot of my lower uh, undergrad degrees were in mechanical engineering and business. Uh, but I kind of look back and everything I was doing was really was industrial engineering. I just didn't know it at the time. So I'll give you a very simple brief explanation what industrial systems engineering do. Because we actually don't make anything like physical. Everything that we do has nothing to do with like making like a car or anything like that. We're part of the process, but we don't actually build a car. So I'll give you a very brief instruction, a very, very simple example where an industrial system engineer will play a major role. Um, the Cybertruck, right? This is the probably the most controversial vehicle in the last 20, 30 years. I don't know, some people love it, some people hate it, but it's, it's on the news all the time. And finally, I think it's gonna start coming out and people are gonna get their deliveries. So let's say there's a goal, Elon Musk sets, uh, sets a goal. We're gonna produce 1,000 of these per month and deliver to customers who have been waiting for like 10 years. Okay, so we're gonna finally deliver them. It's finally here, Wall Street's happy. Let's start delivering these trucks, okay? So then if you actually wanna deliver, or produce and deliver 1,000 of these per month, what are some of the variables or factors that affect our, our ability to reach this goal? Okay, so I'll give you kind of 10 seconds to kind of think about this. So, you know, you and I just go to the, you know, a Tesla dealership in a mall and make a down payment and do the financing it shows up in our doors, I guess. But uh, if you're actually sending these cars out and putting them in customers' hands, what are some of the variables that are going to affect their ability to do so? Okay. So this is where you can kind of think of where industrial system comes in. We don't actually build a car ourselves. We don't design the car ourselves. But that question there is if you want to actually deliver a thousand of these in a month, what are all of the logistics? all of the factors that must basically be tested and you know, verified has to work out so that we can actually meet those goals, okay? So it involves a lot of people, basically. You need a workforce. You need, uh, you know, you need manufacturing workforce. You need salespeople. You need finance people. You need all of those people to line up, basically, so that you can make this happen. Uh, you need materials. You have to make the cars out of something, right? Or do you have the raw materials? Uh, are the raw materials going to arrive from Asia or you know, different parts of the world? Do you have them in the ready at the quality that you need to actually produce these? Do you have the equipment? Do you have the capacity in your factory to produce the parts to do so? Uh, do you have the right information? Do you have basically uh, information on where these things need to go? Um, you know, the latest sales forecast, availability of people, equipment, and materials, um, and energy as well. You got to think about, you know, different ways that are we going to have the, not just, you know, I guess you can think of like physical energy themselves, but do we have the energy at the right price to produce these things at a volume, right? So these are some of the things you have to think about. Again, I'm kind of very simplifying this, you know, very, very quickly here. There are numerous other factors you gotta think about to basically get one of these cars off the lot and really into the consumer's hands. You gotta think about all of these things. So industrial engineering is concerned with the design, improvement, installation, and integrated system. When you have to produce something this complex, there are a lot of systems that are involved, people, equipment, materials, information, how do the, all of these things work together to get the outcome that you want, okay? So uh, here's some, again, examples, production plan based on labor, material, equipment, availability, and constraints. You might not have the labor availability, even if you have the materials to produce a thousand of these, okay? Then what do we do, okay? Optimizing and distributing materials, equipment to increase production rates. 
Uh, maybe we have multiple plans. How do we then allocate the people, the workforce, and the materials to get the maximum throughput? Um, and design the assembly line layout so that you get the maximum throughput out. Uh, reducing rework, waste, and decrease manufacturing. You don't want to build one of these cyber trucks, roll them off the line, and realize, oh, there's major defects on these parts. They have to redo them, right? So, what are some of the ways to design your system so that you don't have these defects from the beginning? Okay, how do you detect them, and how do you basically get root those out? Okay, same applies for semiconductor manufacturing, uh, toys, right? Uh, PCs, anything that you manufacture, there's going to be some defects. How do you reduce those? Okay, so again. I'm probably offending a lot of industrial engineers, uh, you know, by simplifying it so much. But basically, we're worried about this big microscopic look at these large systems here, how they all tie in together to get the outcome that we want. Okay. Um, so I just I just go over it very briefly here. We're all over the place. Um, any anywhere around the world, you look at any product or service. It doesn't have to be a product; it could be a service, hospitals, healthcare, what, um, anything to look at. There's some type of industrial systems engineering involved. Um, otherwise, the modern economy wouldn't function. Um, we're, we play major roles, um, you know, disaster relief, basically. If there's a, Maui just had a, you know, a wildfire, right? You have to have industry just go in there, figure out what are the logistics so that we can get the maximum aid in to get the, you know, get the health aid into the right people. What does that look like? Someone has to do the logistics there to figure out what's the best way to do that, okay? Um, so there's a lot of things that we get involved in. Um, so the one part, so our major is very broad. Um, within our major, there's like quality engineering, there's Lean Six Sigma, et cetera. The area that I'm most close uh, related to is operations research, which one way you think about it is just optimization of resources, okay? Um, so it encompasses the development and use of a wide range of um, problem solving uh, techniques and methods in the pursuit of, of um, improved decision-making efficiency, such as optimizing and simulation. Um, Within OR, it's also very broad too. Uh, different operation research engineers work on very different things. Uh, a lot of people work on finance because you know they, they get paid very well. Uh, but it could be logistics, it could be you know, all sorts of things. Okay. Um, I think the example I want to highlight here is in logistics because uh, most people order stuff online and they get packages delivered to their doors. So you can kind of literally see that logistics have played there. So if you had anything delivered from Amazon or UPS, uh, you just order it. It's shows up your door. Give you a simple example here where operation research and industry engineering more broadly plays a role here. Uh, so let's say I have these nine, let's say I'm a UPS driver. I have nine deliveries I got to make, okay? How many different ways are there to deliver these nine packages to these nine different homes? Just these nine. How many do you think there are? Um, if you have, if you want to use a chat window here, just throw out an answer. Say I'm a Amazon Prime driver, nine deliveries. How many different ways are there? So this is one example. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? So there's I've reached all nine. That's one possible way. Okay. How many different ways are there? Aiden guys. 360,880. So Aiden, good job. Um, how did you get that answer? Exactly, nine factorial, right. Just for these nine deliveries, there's 362,880 different ways to make these deliveries, okay? All right, so there's a lot of different possibilities, right? I could have gone from here to top left, to the middle one, to the center one, that's right. Just for these nine, right, okay? So the question is then, which one is the best route and how do we know it's the best route, okay? And this is where an operator can tell you what the best route is and how do you uh, basically prove that's the best route, okay? 362,880 for nine plate, nine deliveries. Out of this, we know there's one right answer, basically, one best route. Now, for an average UPS driver, they make about 150 deliveries or 120 to 150 deliveries per day, 55,000 drivers in the U.S. Um, so just imagine the number of possibilities out there if you're running UPS. You can't do it manually, right? So this is where you have to come up with very clever algorithms to figure out what's the most efficient route, what's the best route, and you know you got to prove that's the best route. Okay, so the best way to kind of think about this is I I you know I don't watch very many movies. I definitely don't watch a lot of Marvel movies, but there's this one scene where I remember watching this like ah oh, this is exactly what operation engineering is. So it's a short clip. If you watch Infinity War, 
um, about five years ago. Here it is. You. Your math is blowing my mind. Excuse me? But does your friend often do that? Strange. We all right? Be back, Jeremy. Hey, what was that? Went forward in time to view alternate futures, to see all the possible outcomes of the coming conflict. How many did you see? 14,605. How many did we win? One. So that's kind of what an operation research engineer does. That's, I sit in my office, just think like that, and then out of that many uh, you know, different, different possibilities, there's usually one right answer. So that's a joke, by the way. So, um, but that's really what do we do is, um, you know, if you have all kinds of different ways of doing something, what is the best way to do it? Um, and how do you get there, right? Um, we know what the outcome, we, we know what we want to get to. How do we get there today to get there? Basically, what's the best decision today? So just like Dr. Strange, uh, so Dr. Strange is in a way is an, is an industrial engineer, he's an operation research person. He's looked at 14 million different possibilities. He found the one right answer, right? And, you know, if you think about it, so, you know, the rise of AI and all of this is really, we can do what Dr. Strange does a lot quicker now, right? So not even Dr. Strange isn't that cool anymore because we could do it even faster in a way. Um, so I think um, this is a general graphic that shows you, um, the, I'm not gonna go into any definition. I think um, Dr. Olson gave you, I didn't get the all the details, but I think she gave you some details or some damage. So I'm not going into a lot of details here, Artificial intelligence obviously is getting big. Within artificial intelligence, there's a, a subset called machine learning. And within machine learning, there's deep learning. There's a little timeline on the center of that diagram there. And that really kind of shows you the, the progression here. It's really only exploded in the last 10 years because of deep learning. And now people are talking more about artificial intelligence, but it's really been around for many, many decades. And you know, I'm kind of glad that people are, the public like, now has a, a better awareness to it, uh, which just means that this will just get more accelerated. Um, but if you're in our area, I mean, basically, this has been something that we've been looking at and you know, been dealing with for gener uh, decades. So, um, you know, it's just been amplified and the time timeline has just been pulled forward a little. Um, so if you're an industrial engineer, if you're especially in operation research, there's been a bigger focus on going to data science and more specifically in data science, machine learning. So a lot of our graduates have been going into, you know, industry after graduating and they become data scientists basically. And their typically job is to work on machine learning algorithms, figuring out, uh, you know, basically different, you know, algorithms to optimize X, Y, or Z. Um, so data science, again, <clears throat> very brief uh, definition. Data science blends data analytics, computer science and business expertise to, to solve business and other type of problems. Um, so data scientists are basically, this is their job. Um, a lot of people in industrial engineering, especially in operation research, this is just a very natural fit for a lot of them. For so someone like me, this would be a very natural fit because the way we see the world, the way you kind of try to quantify the world, it lends itself to data science. And then machine learning specifically is a subset of AI that allows for optimization, algorithms that help improve performance through supervised, unsupervised reinforced learning, which basically is OR. So you know, we're trying to optimize all these processes, looking at all the different outcomes, trying to find the best route or best solution to something like this. So again, this kind of naturally for us in our field, now there's some fancy words for it, but it's really natural for us, um, the way we view the world. So, um, you know, that's really, this series where I'm gonna try to make a connection with um, AI here is a lot of the industrial engineering, uh, growth in industrial engineering is going into data science and machine learning, which is basically a subset of AI, okay? Um, I think you've probably seen lots of different examples through the, 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 you know, the six or seven weeks you've had through this seminar. Um, how you know AI is could be scary, but it's just another tool. So you know, I think everyone gets that. Um, it's all the way around us, whether you like it or not. Um, if you use Google Maps, you're using an AI product. Um, it's constantly gathering data from you and trying to improve um, its performance. So it's trying to find optimal routes based on you know previous uh, performance. Um, you know your shopping experience on Amazon, etc. All of this is really a form of AI, whether you like it or not. Autonomous vehicles, that's a form of AI. All of these things, even your nest thermometer or you know, at home is a type of AI. So 
Um, you know, whether we like it or not, it's all here. These are, I would say, more mundane examples. I think one chat GPT came out, people just kind of start freaking out, but it's a, it's a more, I guess, um, you know, uh, explicit example, I guess. But, you know, a lot of these AI kind of applications have already, already surrounded us. Um, it's been with us for decades. Um, it's just now because of deep learning and the computing power we have, it's just been amplified and it's gonna to continue to be amplified. It's gonna explore even more. Um, so let me talk about more so kind of generative AI use cases, which is for example, ChatGPT. Now, especially my general AI is that it creates this brand new content out of no, basically out of thin air. It seems like it's doing thin air, but it's really not. Um, so it's generating new content that didn't exist before, which is new, okay? Um, if you look at the, the industry today, uh, if you were to kind of go look at the Fortune 500 companies, et cetera, the most common ways that these companies are trying to use generative AI like, like ChatGPT or their own platform is really number one way is for software development. Uh, there are various reasons why this is true, but um, one way to think about it is simply because of cost. It's very expensive to hire a you know, large army of software engineers to do development. So to kind of reduce that cost and increase the speed of it, um, you're gonna use generative AI you know, platforms to speed up the process and lower the cost. So you know, if you're a very low level, um, so how do I, I'm gonna be very careful my phrasing here. If you're, if you're a programmer, but you're, you're basically very good programmer, but you know, you're, you're, you, know, you, know the, you know how to program stuff and that's it. Um, you know, basically a lot of those skills, I would say it could be replicated with generate, generate AI very, very quickly. But if you're a high level programmer, you have all the programming skills, but you know, you could think critically and connect all the dots. I mean, then you're still very valuable. Um, so a lot of companies are looking for ways to, you know, basically increase, improve software development. So how to write code, automate testing, documentation, et cetera, trying to increase the speed of this. Um, and this is probably the number one way people are using generative AI today. Another way is customer service. Uh, we've all been on customer call centers, right? We've, we've called the number to make a complaint or whatever. The experience is always good. So a lot of companies are trying to use generative AI to improve the performance. So handle a simple service request, um, chatbot or whatever, you know, if you go on a chat on a, uh, like, I don't know, uh, you know Amazon's uh, website or any kind of retailer. Um, help agents themselves, also a physical, uh, a human agent can use generative AI to kind of make their performance better. Uh, I think the most well-publicized best example of this is Discover, the credit card company. Uh, they use generative AI at the call center. And what it showed is people, the, low, the lowest performing uh, employees or call center agents, they increase their productivity a lot more than people who are already high performing. Um, and I, I forget the exact numbers, but I think there was like a 30 to 40% boost for the lowest performing call center agents, while the high performing, their gains were very, very minimal. So what this kind of shows is kind of levels out the playing field with people trying to catch up. Um, it's really a great tool to increase their productivity and really, you know, it helps them be more productive, uh, which is, I think, is a good thing. So that's one area I think a lot of companies are using generative AI. Um, the third one is finance and accounting. So a simple data analysis, forecasting, um, you know, this is, I, I think the, the people are worried that all the CPAs or um, accountants out there, their jobs are going to be replaced. That's really not going to happen overnight, but you know, some of the simple, low-level, I would say, um, you know, mundane tasks, they're being replaced by generative AI tools, which I think is a good thing. I think there's a, you know, we already have a shortage in CPAs in the U.S. anyways, so this is going to kind of kind of fill that vacuum anyways. So you know, that's these are the primary three ways that generative AI is being utilized today. Um, so let me kind of wrap this all around. Industrial engineering operations research within industry engineering, machine learning, uh, you know, deep learning, and then generative AI, what's happening today. Let me wrap this all together and kind of try to conclude here in a, few, in a couple of slides here. So for someone like me in operations research and industrial engineering, the way you look at the world, if you're in the data science realm, it's really just, you know, you kind of think of four data, types of data analytics. Um, you take any kind of problem and try to figure it really it's this kind of progression of questions. Um, you go through what's called uh, descriptive analytics or diagnostic analytics. Um, based on the data right now, what's happening? And then diagnostic analysis, why is it happening? Okay, so uh, let's say it shows that, you know, I don't know, um, I know you just make something up. A uh, bunch of people, I'm in a hotel room now, so I'm just make something up from scratch here. Uh, people are canceling reservations to our hotel um, very frequently, more than ever in the last year. Why, what, what, you know, how do we detect that? Is it all of the customers or is it a certain segment of the population? 
Is it business travelers? Is it leisure travelers? Is it people in our platinum level? Is it people in our you know, no membership? Is it people with certain flights? Um, why is it happening? Okay, those are really the first level of questioning. So you gotta have the data skills kind of figure out these things, okay? The second task is then is predictive analytics. Once you know this, then let's say I wanna change something where we're gonna change our policy. Uh, you know, when you can cancel, we're gonna basically you know, change the cancellation policy. We're gonna make it a lot easier or maybe, you know, maybe the, the fees change. If you're a certain status, the way you cancel is gonna change. We're gonna change certain variables to see if that has any effect. We're gonna have a big model that tells us before we actually do it, if you were to change these variables, what's actually gonna happen? Do, do those our cancellation actually change or not? Overall cancellation change or not? So what's going to happen, okay? And then uh, finally is then, if you know our model tells us this is what's gonna happen, what should we do now then to accomplish some of the goals that we want? We wanna basically, you know, we wanna reduce our cancellation by let's say 50% over the next three months, okay? Then what should we do today? Should we, you know, roll this out, advertise this, send out a huge ad campaign? Should we start sending out personalized you know, campaigns? Uh, should we incentivize our, you know, uh, commer or you know, a business sales team to incentivize this at the corporate level? Okay, what's the right way to, you know, act today or maybe tomorrow or next week to get to that end goal? Okay, so this is inherently a someone like me in OR is use the world. Uh, this is any problem that you see, you don't jump to any conclusion. Um, you know, you see a lot of homelessness in, in the world, right? You don't just say, oh, it's because, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make any assumptions there. I'm very uncomfortable trying to generalize here. Uh, you would have to look at the data and figure out what's causing this homelessness. Um, if we don't do anything, what's going to happen? Um, let's say we set up a, you know, we're going to launch a new, you know, reduce homelessness campaign. And we have a model to predict what's going to happen. Okay. Um, let's see what happens in our model. And then what's the optimal way to act today if we want to reduce homelessness today or, or in the city of San Diego by half within the year? What should we do today? Okay. So that's inherently the way we think through these problems. Um, so, um, you know, with rise of AI and generative AI and all of these tools, really, it's, you know, it really accelerates this process. So we can get to some of these bigger problems even quicker. So of course, there are some little caveats and you know, some things we have to worry about, but overall, it's a huge productivity tool for us. And you know, for me, I was, you know, again, for us, it's nothing new. It's just when the public got aware of ChatGPT, it basically brought all the timelines forward because now there's gonna be a lot more interest and investment in this area. So we know what would have taken 20 years for us to accomplish, it's gonna happen in let's say 10 or five years. So, which I think is good for humanity. I think we need a lot of these advancements to make the world a better place for everybody. So for me, I mean, I'm a, I'm a naturally a, a, a you know, practical, I'm an optimist person. So I think this is a good thing. Um, broadly speaking, um, if you look at an operational engineer and in, in systems engineering, we're trying to improve systems and process by making them faster, making them more accurate, making them more efficient and more, making them more effective. Okay, that's what really, we're, we're kind of, that's in our DNA. We want to make things better. We want to make it, whatever exists right now, we want to make it the next version that's even better and better and better. That's what we want. And that typically means it's faster, it's more accurate than before, much more efficient, it's a lot more effective at addressing the problem, okay? Um, often, we, often what that means is that for a lot of many decades, I would say it means like kind of removing the person's, uh, each person's decision-making out of their hands almost in some cases, because uh, humans tend to kind of mess things up a lot of times, although they, on a lot of cases, they are the critical piece. Sometimes like having them really you kind of nudge them in a certain way so that they don't make, they don't mess it up basically, uh, which means automation. But, you know, in a lot of cases, though, it's really not removing a person, it's really helping that person make the right call, okay? And also cost reduction. Everything that you see out there today with our iPhones and all the technology we have, it was only possible because we learned how to make them faster and more efficiently. Otherwise, they'll be way too expensive for you and I to all buy. So um, all of this advantage you've seen really happened because we were able to accomplish these things. Um, really, the last thing I, I want to get to is like, for an operational research engineer, it might seem like it's very cold and cutthroat, right? Faster, like you're efficient. The last point is really important for us. Um, you know, it's gotta be an effective solution for us, okay? So effective or best solutions, it's not always the fastest, accurate, or efficient. So the route that I showed you earlier with the nine dots, even though there's one best route, we may not take that route because it tends to, let's say it goes through a school zone and we want to avoid that. 
even though it's faster, we just don't want to take that risk. Okay, so that's more of an effective solution because the risks are higher, or it goes through a, I don't know, a construction zone that, that maybe cause more delays on certain days or another. So we know that, so we're going to put that in an algorithm, so we're going to avoid that, right? So speed-wise, not the best. Uh, fuel efficiency, it's not, it's not the best, but it's going to be a more effective solution. Maybe the drivers like that route better because they go through trees or something, right? You can design it however you want, but... You know, it's the designer's critical thinking skills, their emotional intelligence, and the social context awareness that makes it really a good solution. Okay, so um, we always have to keep that in mind. So I think for operating research engineers, you want to be a really good one. Um, you you got to be really good at programming. You got to be really good at problem stats. Understand. You got to understand this world from a probability statistics perspective, not a, like a black and white thing. You know, things happen. What's you know basically what's the probability of that happening when things extraordinary happens okay um is this just by chance or is it something brand new we're looking at something out of the ordinary actually you're looking at okay and then take all that into context and figure out if we want to accomplish this goal what's the best way to get there and you got to account for some of these non-technical factors as well okay so you know this is really from an industrial engineering perspective all the advances that we've seen it's really just what we've seen for generations but it's just more amplified i think the world's getting more complicated and it kind of lends itself that we need more tools are even faster so we can solve these more bigger problems. So it kind of makes sense where we are. Um, let, I'll, I'll kind of talk over these, some of these pictures here. One would argue industrial engineering was born out of manufacturing. In World War II, we, we had to deliver you know, these large warships very, very quickly. Henry Ford with the assembly line, we had to produce these parts very, very quickly, specialization, et cetera. Um, you know, if you were to look at an auto manufacturing plant today, what it versus what it was when Henry Ford was building on his you know, Model T, they look very different. So I'll show you, I'm gonna just show you a very short clip here while I'm talking about this. So if you were to go to modern you know, car manufacturing, it's a blend of automation and humans. So humans are still involved here, but you know, it's a lot of automation, okay? And now you might argue, okay, you know, this is good or bad, but I would say a lot of those people on the previous picture who are working on making little uh, the little wheels and every little part, I don't think they wanted to do that forever, right? I think they don't, they just didn't have a lot of choice, right? So having these robots do these things for us, it's really been, a, I think, a win for humanity. Uh, we, don't, we don't want people to work on those things for their entire lives. Uh, we want them to do something they want to enjoy, um, something they want to you know, find themselves being more productive or you know, some creative work or whatever they want to do. So you know, this has been a big improvement for us um, if you look at you know, our, our whole society. Um, there's again, there's still humans involved playing a role, but a lot of these processes that were done by humans, they've been completely automated. And then it's made it, it it's, there's less errors now. Uh, we're much better at building things with less defects. So the overall cost of these have gone down considerably. So all of us can enjoy these things now. Um, you know, so that's been a huge win for us, I think, as a species. Um, let me show you another thing here. Um, if you were to look at, a, oops, uh, okay, that's bad here. Sorry. Oh, there it is. Let me show you another here. When I talk over, so you know, more automation is going to happen. So this is like an example of a robot that Amazon basically built uh, called Scooter. Um, again, you know, I think when first these uh, kind of automatic robots start showing up at warehouses, people are obviously scared and they're kind of, am I going to lose my job, etc. Um, I don't think people want to run around these gigantic warehouses fetching every little item. Uh, I just don't think that's what people prefer to do. So we have robots do that for us, but again, humans are so involved, we have to design the system so that they work basically seamlessly with humans, et cetera. So, um, you know, if you're in this scenario, you've seen this change happen faster and faster. Um, and you know, I think it can be scary, the changes, but ultimately, you know, the, the human piece is always going to be there. And ultimately, we as a species, we as humans have to decide what we want, right? So, um, you know, I think yeah, it's whether, I'm not gonna say it's, you know, whether general AI is good or bad, it's gonna happen in a way, it's already here. It's been here for many decades. Um, I think all of the people who have spoken through the series, I'm sure they've said this is a tool and, you know, it's here. So you're gonna have to learn to embrace it. I personally think for, uh, from our field, this is, I'm very lucky to be alive, I think, right now, because I get to witness so many changes very, very quickly. And we're seeing major changes today happening at rapid pace. So there are so many opportunities. So um, 
I think, you know, if you want to do great work, let's say in you know, healthcare or, you know, whatever you want to do, there's just so many different complex problems out there that you can work on. And AI is just going to, you know, is another great tool and really it's an amplifier that allows you to do that. Okay. So that's really kind of my perspective on AI. Uh, but never forget your uniqueness and really the human element. Without that, all of this is meaningless. All the problems that we talk about, they're problems because we humans decided that they're problems, right? So, um, you know, you know that you know effective solutions means you have to understand, you have to have very, very good critical thinking skills, emotional intelligence, understand social context, to come up with very effective uh, solutions to solve the most complicated problems. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Hopefully, I'll short. Um, Anything else, Felisa? That no, that was such an excellent way to wrap up this entire seminar. <laughs> um, it's 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 so true. Like you know, AI can enhance the human experience and humanity, but it doesn't mean it's going to erase us. And so, thinking about these you know extensive and complex problems and how we can use technology to um, improve that is such an optimistic way to end this this <laughs> series. So, thank you for that.